Welcome to today's episode of The Square. Today we're having a curious conversation with Donald Strum. And Donald Strum is the principal in charge of product, furniture, and graphic design at Michael Graves. And he is behind some of the coolest innovative designs that range from healthcare to housewares to even jewelry. I'm joined with my co-host, Tanya White. Thanks Hello. for being back, Tanya. <laughs> and of course, Donald. Thank you so much for being here, Donald. Oh, sure, Brandon. Absolutely. Hey, Tanya. Hi there. So. Before we get going, tell me just a little bit about yourself. Like, was at what point was it that you realized design was something that just excited you in a way that nothing else does? Yeah, it, uh, does, that's, it was 10 years old. 10 years old. You, you know really specifically. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it was family, vacation, heading down to Florida, summer of 1972. You know, headed uh, with my, my, our family in a big giant Christ, uh, Vista Cruiser. There were six of us just crowding the car, and we came <laughs> upon this front gate, uh, and we went through the gate, and then this castle started to reveal itself to us. And wow. then we got started to get closer and closer, and I realized that there's something really going on here that I've never experienced before in my life. And you know, I, I know it might sound cliche about talking about an experience of entering Disney World, but in 1972, mm. there was no other Disney World. It had just, it was still off-gassing, the whole place. You know, it was so shiny, shiny new. And you, you and they, they made sure, I just remember looking at my sister and we're like, we're here, it's happening. Just suspend any belief <laughs> of anything else that you thought about and just go with it. So it really was about experience and Disney mm. offered you an experience. So at 10 years old, I realized like you can control the environment. You can express a way of seeing things that even the way you take out the garbage or collect the garbage within the park can be done differently. And you, it was like the, it was the big moments and it was also the small moments for me. So that, that was my first introduction to design at a very large scale, but it wasn't. It was also at a very smaller scale of how they handle all the details as you enter the park and as you experience each and every attraction. What, what are some of those small details that stand out in your mind, you know, this many years later? Uh, just the, the authenticity or the way they re would replicate an authenticity of a small town the way just the studying ideas of how they would do tile work and mosaic works. So I remember mm. being riding through a monorail through the, uh, the Contemporary Hotel and seeing this large 10 story mosaic, but each mosaic was made up of this tiny little tile that was depicting yep. the larger pic the big, the bigger picture. And they just, they, just, they just made sure that everything was being seen in a new way. You know, at all those different scales, whether it was a large attraction, whether it was how you entered the park, whether it was how you threw something out. You know, if you threw something into a garbage can, I, I keep talking about the garbage can because I remember I was fascinated by that. <laughs> if, I, if I watched someone throw a gum wrapper, within seconds, someone was there to pick it up and there was never any gum anywhere. It was just, it always, they always kept in this pristine state and you just felt special. And I think that's it and it brought you joy. And I think for me with design, that's always been the, the sort of strongest tenets is I want people to experience joy in whatever they're, whatever they're, um, whatever they are experiencing with our products. You know, so anything they're, they're either touching or walking through a building, I want them to be seeing it in a new way, feeling it in a new way. It's not about, you know, sort of revolution in that, but it's, a, it's all about the touch points and the tactile essence of how they are taking it in, absorbing it, changing their behaviors as they use it in a good positive way okay so i have a confession to make i grew up in florida i grew up about an hour from orlando from disney world and when we first moved there from texas um i was homeschooled and so mom got a season pass oh gosh, to, awesome. to disney world <laughs> I, I swear, we went uh, 28 times the first year. We were probably the only people that ever wore out a season pass. Wow. But the thing that, the thing that I remember about it um, is what an immersive experience it is and, and yeah. not like how you, you don't think about all the design that goes into it mm -hmm. when you're experiencing it. And I'm curious because, you know, years later, actually as, as part of some of the stuff we've done with Hugo, and I've read A Day in the Life of Disney where they kind of catalog different 
people's jobs and you just you start to understand what Walt Disney was trying to do with with his parks and how much intentionality and design goes about it is it one of those things where as you're experiencing it the idea is to not be thinking about the design if it's good design I mean I think it's it's about stimulus it's about all this stimulus coming at you and it's all set in a way to uh, I, I would say just to have you remove yourself from your daily life so I think that's you know that was really telling for me that I just got lost in it and I forgot mm -hmm. really about who I was where I came from what I'd been going through I mean you know I, I was 10 years old I was pretty happy overall yeah but, <laughs> but, but just it, it you were just in a totally as you said immersive I was in a different land and I had no I had I had just no record or record of, of ever being in that type of place before but it it felt meaningful right it felt mm -hmm. meaningful to me that they were they want they really cared about me and they wanted me to come back it wasn't just like one and done and I think that's all part of the, the formula and the chemistry of it too, is they, they want you to share it with the next generation. And we've been really good in my life of going back like every five years. Every five years we go back because we always know there's gonna be something new and there's gonna be something you know, else that they want to bring to us for us to experience in a, new, in a different way. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's really powerful. You know? and, mm. and the one other thing I wanna to add to it is I wanted to work for Disney. I remember writing to uh, the chairman of the board, you know, and many letters just asking about this and that, and he, they were always good about answering me. And I'm like, I want to be, I want that job. I want to be chairman of the board of Disney at some point. Uh, but indirectly, years later, I actually had the opportunity of working with the Disney Corporation. We, through the Michael Graves uh, Architecture and Design, we developed a a line of product for them. We worked on their corporate headquarters in Burbank, California, with the using the seven dwar dwarfs as caryatids to hold up, hold up the building. Oh and then gosh. I got to work on all the <laughs> furniture for the Dolphin and the Swan Hotel, which is part of Disney oh, World. Wow! Yeah. So that yeah. So the, and so and then we did a project also in Europe for uh, for uh, Euro Disney. So Very it, cool. So I actually my dream came true in that regard. Uh, we got to design tea kettles um, with the with the essence of Mickey Mouse within the tea kettles, and we we were able to work on all the characters and do merchandise so much so that we were one of the first design firms to ever have carte blanche, not having to go through character integrity, meaning those folks who really you, you can only use the characters in a certain way, but they gave us carte blanche to say, do what you want with these, and we came up with all these home products, uh, house uh, and housewares, you know, is salt and pepper shakers, different types of frames, uh, candlesticks, all using Mickey in a different way. And usually it was always like putting, putting Mickey to work. So, mm -hmm. you know, he just wasn't sort of laying around. He was always engaged. We always thought it was an important part of it. So, you know, that's, so that's really, that, for me, as a designer, I got to, I got to, re, I got to really live my, live my dream in that aspect for Disney. It was really important in my life, and then years later, I got to be a part of it. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. That was really interesting. Um, two huge Disney fans yes. over here. Um, <laughs> they are kind of the titans and originals of user experience, and lots of industries have kind of adopted and, and want to learn their ways. Um, so thank you. Um, when I started reading about your work, um, I was really um, intrigued by um, something I read, which was in 1997, Michael Graves um, and y'all uh, collaborated with Target um, on a line of products. And whenever you read about this collaboration, you hear the term the democratization of design. Mm -hmm. And so I was just interested to hear how that process unfolded and, and what that term really means. Sure. I mean, this, this, you have to, you know, now let's go back. Let's go back to 1997. Let me just lay, lay the <laughs> land out for you. <laughs> you know, there, there was a big player, a uh, big player in the, in the world of Walmart, you know? So Walmart was number one. And then there was a number, there was a number two, you know, and number two was Kmart. You know, Kmart at the time had thousands upon thousands of stores. And then there was this little Midwestern guy, this little Midwestern group called Target that was holding up the rear in number three. And at that time in 1997, when we started to get to know them a little bit, there was only about 700 targets. You know, there were thousands upon thousands of Kmarts and Walmarts. 
So they were looking to differentiate themselves and they were doing really interesting projects. And one of the projects that they did that we were called to arms to help out with was the restoration of the Washington Monument. And you're like, well, why would, why would Target get involved with the restoration of the Washington Monument? Well, they were bringing stores to the East Coast. They only were you know, in, the, in, the, in the Midwest there, in Minneapolis is where they're, where they're out of. And they were starting to expand. And they thought you know, if they could help the Park Service underwrite the restoration of the Washington Monument, that could be a good thing. It's a pretty, pretty big thing, pretty big monument, pretty big building. A lot of people see it and they would get a lot of credit for it as they start to open stores in the DC area. So they came to us and they said, you know, how can you help us design the scaffolding for the Washington Monument? You're like, scaffolding? Like, how do we get involved in that? I mean, scaffolding, you have an idea of what scaffolding looks like, right? It's not pretty. How do you make scaffolding pretty? But more than that, how do you, get, how do you make scaffolding tell a story? Um, so it was really about developing this narrative of what the restoration process was, which was restoring the stones, those big giant blocks in their running bond style, and they're going to be cleaned, and then we're going to redo the, the observation tower up top, and how can that be a story? So we, we took that on, and we made this incredible uh, piece of scaffolding uh, that, that basically told the narrative of what was going on inside, which was the restoration of the block. And we were able to light it in a way that it's never been lit before. And it was so successful in how it was beaming in Washington that coming, come the millennium, they didn't want to take the scaffolding down. And I remember the, the story was that Hillary Clinton called uh, Michael Graves and said, do you mind if we leave it up for the millennium uh, or for the millennial? And Michael said, of course, why would, you know, why would you want to take that down? Yeah, it, it looks so great. And, you know, because it was lit in a way that it hadn't been lit before from the inside out all the way up where before you were throwing light on it. So that was an amazing project, but that led us to, during that pro project, the, the folks from the park department and Target were coming to, to, to our office in Princeton, New Jersey, and the Target people came from Minneapolis, and the parks department came from Washington, and guess what? Amtrak was late, you know, no, big, uh, no big surprise there. And so there was some time to kill, and Michael was uh, with one of the head people of uh, philan the philanthropic arm of Target and said, let's go for a walk, let's kill some time, I'll show you something. And he brought him across to our building, which is the product building, and we, sh we had a little tiny, little tiny company store. You know, it was really for Princeton only. It was 225 square feet of retail bliss, which were all our products at the time that we had, which were tea kettles and ties and jewelry and watches and candlesticks and tablecloths and all the Alessi products that we've been doing. And a light bulb went off in this gentleman's head. His name is Bob Thacker. And he connected, he goes, there's a real story here. Martha's doing her thing for, for Kmart. Walmart's just beating everybody on price. How about if we, Target, look at design as a differentiator? You know, we know we can't beat Walmart at price. Tar you know, Wal Kmart has their thing going on, but maybe design as a differentiator could be can be a big deal. So he brought that idea back to Minneapolis and told some other people about it. And they were curious. And they started coming back out to Princeton and taking a look at what we had. And then we started walking stores together. And they would basically say things like, well, what would you change in this department? If I give you a post-it pad, can you put a post-it on everything you think you might change? And we would turn to them and say, like, you don't have enough post-its. You, know, so <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot to be done here. So that's, that was really the sort of call to arms that Target saw design as a way, as good business, right? And in and, and, and all of the ways, it was always a race to the bottom. It was the lowest price you can imagine. And there was nowhere to go that someone had to seize the moment that there was nowhere to go but up. And Target did that you, by hiring Michael Graves and starting off with a collection of, in the first year, we did 160 products and we launched. And then we launched with another 50 products uh, right after that. And this is 1999 now. So, you know, so we had, a, we had a fast and furious year of developing that product and that collection, and then also developing a brand language, right? That had to come from that. That was really important because it's just not putting stuff on a shelf. It had to be cohesive. It had to tell a story in a way. And again, it's always about that story. And there had to be, there, it, it had to be products that people would would find as cachet that would they would adore they would love they would relish and they would want to use every day in their lives 
And that was the sort of key of what we were bringing. And we did that through the elements that we incorporated into design, whether it was through the materiality, whether it was through certain forms, or whether it was color. That's so okay. interesting. I'm, I'm and super I think... curious. Do you not, are you not able to go into a Target now without kind of your <laughs> business hat on? <laughs> Oh, it's, I mean, they've come a long way. I mean, there, there, there used to be, they, they used to have a, the, I mean, just even the way we, we learned a lot about just how to remove scuff marks off the floor, you know? So, oh, it, wow. it's, so yeah, so every time I go in, I, I find myself removing a scuff mark. You know, I just can't help <laughs> it. <laughs> I think the most interesting part of that whole story is the serendipitous nature of collaborations mm. and innovation, where sometimes it's literally because someone was late and two people went for a walk. I think that's... Awesome. <laughs> yeah, if they if they did t if the if the parks department wasn't late on that train, this might have never happened. Yeah. To your point. So that's, that's what it takes. And then what really what it takes is someone to really to champion the idea. It's just not design. Design is just one aspect of it. You need the synergy of all those parts. You need to understand who the manufacturer is going to be because at the end of the day, you could be making junk. You know, as we as, as I don't know if I can say this, but it's like shit on the shelf. We didn't, we, didn't, yeah. we didn't want that. We wanted something that you had to question, you know, that, like there was a quality going on there and the price reflected that, but it wasn't, it was, it was like the idea of good, better, best. And we had to be at the good, be, the good or the better, best level, but not too much best. It still had to be within the range of that person coming in, experiencing target and saying, you know what? That's really beautiful. I love that. It makes me smile. That was always a part of the formula. And I can absolutely afford that. And that was the, the other thing about mm. the approachability of the objects the, and the accessibility of the objects from an economic standpoint. Really important. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, interestingly enough, you said the word accessibility, which is the question that I kind of want to roll into next, but from um, a more experiential standpoint. Um, so, you know, as designers, it's really important to understand the different types of people and the experiences that they represent and how they're going to be moving through your space or using your product. Um, so how do you design for an audience of varying ability types, right? We've got temporary abil disability, um, situational, permanent. Um, I would just be curious to hear like what that process has looked like t um, with your work. Yeah, uh, I think it's, it's evolved over time. You know, I mean, we weren't developing and working in healthcare right out of the gate, um, but even from the very beginning, uh, from working on our Alessi tea kettle for, for that you see over my shoulder here, it was always about an approachability and an ease of use or an intuitive nature of understanding what the product is exuding, you know, its personality, as we say, and its purpose. We, we don't like to talk in terms of form and functionality, we like to more personify it by saying purpose and personality. So, so in doing that, you know, we wanted to make sure people knew that the water needed to boil faster. And the shape, this conic shape, denotes that idea of the bubbly liquid inside. There's also these little little rivets, you know, so where that that show and denote, and it's a metaphor for bubbly liquid. So bubbly liquid. So we're using. We're using metaphors, we're using high level functionality, we're using ergonomics. The ergonomics happens with the handle. If you look behind my shoulder, you sort of know exactly where to grab and there's little finger, uh, there's little finger curls to it as well. You know, so you know where to place your hand in order to center it right and you know where to pull off the lid. But, you know, but all that sort of comes together and then even the, the, the whistle. You know, so there was a human factors aspect to the handle that we were doing even before, you know, a lot of people knew what the term ergonomics or human factors was. It was just, it was just second nature to us to design it in this way and that it felt balanced. It felt, it felt of a quality and it was going to boil water faster. And at the end of the day, you know, this bird was going to sing, which is a metaphor, you know, for the whistle to let you know that it's time. The water has boiled really quickly and it's time to get on with your day, you know? So, and then to the extreme, when we're working on a wheelchair for for striker in terms of accessibility you know we, we we just we were in observation mode seeing that a lot of wheelchairs especially for the hospital environment didn't have the ability to transfer a patient and we thought you know you basically had to drop someone into the chair this whole idea of like you're in a free fall for a period of time and we thought that's really unnerving for someone who is in a very delicate mm -hmm. position 
um, in, in terms of their healing and they're getting better. And we thought, why can't that, that wheelchair that we're designing for Stryker, why, why can't the arms just move out of the way, lift up, get out of the way in order to do a proper transfer? You know, from a chair to uh, to the to the wheelchair. So it's looking at things in that way. So it's always about for us. It was always about accessibility through metaphor, through understanding, through behavior. Um, you know, just just looking at a product and knowing how it's going to work for you. It's ease of use. Uh, to you know, cognitive accessibility, working for people with uh, disabilities uh, of of all different types. And I think you you have to design, especially in healthcare, for the for the 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 worst possible condition and mm -hmm. if you can do that if you can achieve that it's going to work for everybody else so i think you know once we grew up and we evolved uh from doing the early runs of the, the, some of those early products to what we were doing at the end of the day with the, with the wheelchair you know we we made sure every all those needs were being addressed you know so that's that was a big part of it so how do you allow those products, especially in healthcare, but I think it can be really in, in any field, to merge with a lot of what's happening with technology. So in other words, the Internet of Things and thinking through smart devices and biometrics, everything from what's on your wrist to a cane or, or a wheelchair and how that is something that can become a digital and a dynamic uh, object. Yeah, I mean, the, the way Again, we're a design consultancy, so we, you know, we rely re rely on our relationships and the people we're going to work with um, to determine how much they want to do, what's appropriate in many times. So, as you can see, I'm not, and really, um, just because with technology, just because you can do something, doesn't always mean you should. You know, we're we're and and I and I say that. So we we use technology within the right measure and not forcing it upon a product because at the end of the day, we're looking to design products that are gonna improve people's lives. And if something, if it's technology for technology's sake, it's, it, we view it as superfluous in that way. So it has to be in the right condition that it's really integrating in your lives. And, and I think that's naturally occurring in the way we design products and the way we're experiencing life right now with just the the involvement of 5G coming on. It's, you know, it's gonna change a lot of things for us. Um, just the way we're having this conversation right now. You know, we're, we're using this virtual format and platform and we're using technology seamlessly uh, so far. <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's about appropriateness for, for us. So we don't force it upon, we just, through the research, through as we work on a program, uh, we make sure that it's it's going to be um, done in the right light. Like we we've just developed a it's it's a it's a measurement for barbecue, so that you could you know be doing slow cook slow cook barbecue you know uh, uh, smoking on the on the on your smoker and you could be somewhere else in the house or somewhere else in the land and your smoker you have constant touch of your of the temperature of your smoker at all times. So you know that was that was appropriate in that regard for for that Sign client up. to say, yeah, "I'm hungry." Yeah, yeah. So you have that brisket on there for five or six hours, and you want to maintain that constant uh, temperature. But then you got to go pick the kids up at school. That's a reality of it. Yep. Or what used to be school. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. So so you're able to keep in constant touch with your brisket <laughs> to know how it's doing. <laughs> Technology for yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm but all joking. Yeah, I, I, I know them. exactly what you're talking about. Like I've had to, I've thrown a brisket on the green egg <laughs> and had to constantly go out like every 15 minutes and go check the temperature or maybe angle it towards the window so I don't have to actually go outside. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. And then just, just knowing that we're all on Zoom calls now and this, and I'm just looking out my window on a daily basis from observations at home and I'm coming up with like how, you know, how do we, how do we change and improve mailboxes and packages arriving to my house on a daily basis? You know, how can I have a better pantry? Is there something technology wise of knowing when things are going to be done with my pantry and how that, you know, the idea of tele, telemedicine, my mother is quarantined in assisted living and she's seeing all her doctors through telemedicine. i um, just been looking at, um, trash cans and the way they recycle, you know, because my, my mm -hmm. studio overlooks when the garbage man comes every day. So it's these really mundane things, these everyday occurrences that sort of intrigue me. You know, can, can I develop a new system 
for how you bring your trash to the curb, your recycling to the curb. You know, what can that look like? You know, what, what can that be for people of all ages, people of all disabilities? Can someone in a wheelchair bring their garbage can down to the curb? And then at that point, the garbage, can, the garbage man himself or garbage person, how can they get it up into the truck in the easiest met fashion? So those are the sort of things on my mind and those are the sort of things that can incorporate new technology. Well, and that's, that's a great lead in because I was going to actually ask you, you know, what's, it just, I, I totally agree with you that just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and so is there a, an object, and I, I'm sure trash can is one of them, that has a, is a traditional object, a traditional analog object that actually does benefit from something like digital Internet of Things type connectivity? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you about this. We just got... We just got notice uh, uh, or an email from our friends in, in Italy at Alessi saying that our, the tea kettle, this tea kettle, is now going to become an internet of things. And, and it's something they have, they have done, something they're interested in. I don't, actually, I don't even know if I should be talking about it, but, I, but you know, that tea <laughs> kettle's been out for 35 years. You know, what do you, you know, they're going to do something to it that... And I'm, I'm wondering what, what it is. What are they going to do to that tea kettle to bring the Internet of Things to it? I mean, it's obviously it might run through an electric tea kettle, which we have already, and they're probably going to let you determine the temperature of your water. And again, I don't know this for a mm -hmm. fact. I know there's a lot of tea drinkers out there that take their tea very seriously, and they demand... And the temperature of their water very seriously. Yeah, it's for really different tea, types of how teas. You steep, how you <laughs> steep your tea at a certain temperature... But now, you know, is that going to let you know when you're somewhere else in the house or somewhere else that your tea is at the optimal temperature to pour in order to bring the best out in those tea leaves? You know, I'm, so I'm just, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, you know, I'm really curious about this. And, you know, even for us, we're, I, I, the other thing I'm re really curious about is just those type of uh, experiences that are overlooked. You know, I talked about the mm. trash can experience. What could that be? But also for us, it's the, maybe it's the, the sort of aging experience. You know, what's happening as we get older? And again, that was brought about from my, my firsthand witnessing of Michael Graves going through a horrible paralysis. You know, so if, if I do have a moment, I, it just, in 2003, Michael became paralyzed overnight. And it just changed the course of our practice. Uh, where, you know, before we were designing cocktail shakers and uh, pepper and salt mills and, you know, and, and brooms and, and toilet bowl brushes, all of a sudden it's like, well, can you be put aside a little time to maybe address the idea of wellness and, you know, where the, patient, where the patients heal? You know, and, and through architecture we determine, like, it's not, it's not necessarily in those big, giant areas of the entryways, the of coming into the hospital, those, those big hallways, um, the really the healing happens in the patient room and we thought we needed to do our work there first. So, you know, so Michael Graves firsthand experienced four rehab centers, eight different hospitals, and it was just not a dignified way to get better, you know, and it, it mm. just really wasn't thought out well. And you know, so we thought we can do something about it, knowing that, you know, we're architects, we're designers, and now our boss, you know, our founder, is experiencing it firsthand as a patient. You know, what can we do to change that way? How can we make a better experience for these products that are overlooked? Um, they're not very dignified. They remind you of how well you're not feeling, you know, because there's a lot of self-identity involved, of how you think about yourself, the behavior of that, of how you view yourself in your world. And now all of a sudden you have to Think about that in a way that it's, it might not give you joy anymore. So is there a way that we can take some of those common objects, those mundane overlooked objects, and have them seen in a new light? And for us, it was really st starting in the patient room, but then we also decided let's start uh, in the home. Are there those types of experiences in the home that can be, can be challenged? You know, so something, for instance, like bath safety. Right, so you've you've a you've just did this incredible renovation, or you have this bathroom a certain way, and now all of a sudden a commode has to be placed on the toilet. So I know I'm I'm going into some, as I say, non sexy stuff, uh, but it <laughs> but changes it changes yeah. the entire environment for who's ever using that bathroom, 
and mm -hmm. whether it's the person who's the main user or a guest or a family member. And why can't you think about that commode in the same way you think about your bath hardware or your bathtub or your toilet? Why can't it integrate itself versus being this eyesore of that there's a sick person in the house or there's an mm -hmm. older person in the house? So it's about integration, right? We think that's important that you integrate them so they become seamless, they're a part of. Do you know, do you know what, do you know what, have you experienced that before yourselves? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I literally had the conversation last night with my mother-in-law because her mother is in the exact situation you're talking about. Like, she was like, hey, I need you to come swap out a toilet for me. And, and we were, but we were talking about like, what's going to be most comfortable for her. And, you yeah. know, she's getting older. And so I know, I mean, it, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah. So we're, we're taking that on. We're taking the idea of bath safety on, which is for us, you know, we're, we're, we're working with a very special, uh, a very, a very special client who sees our vision. And as you know, just like from starting with Target, you need that champion. You need that person who is, you know, not going to fall for like, well, we just have to make it this much cheaper it, it, or it just has to have this less material. It, it has to speak in a way that it's confident. The product has to, you know, basically say, I'm here to change the day. I'm here to integrate, you know, I, I, I and, and that's, and that's really being brave when basically in the world of uh, home healthcare, it's a race to the bottom. It's what they call DME, durable medical equipment. And even that aisle, when you go into that aisle at the, at the pharmacy to do what you're, Brandon, what you're doing, like you, someone's fallen, they've had a, a sort of cataclysmic event, uh, or they have to get a new hip or a new knee, and you're like, well, go get that mm -hmm. hip kit at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at, one of those far, at one of the pharmacies, and it's gonna be some form of raised toilet seat, and it's gonna be a, some form of male or female urinal, you know, with that, and it, so, that aisle that the, in the pharmacy store that they call it, they, it's, it's like one of the worst performing aisles. No one wants to go there. No one wants to shop it. They call it the Isle of Death. And I thought like, that's, just, <laughs> that's just a horrible name for a shopping experience, mm -hmm. going to the Isle of Death. Yeah. You know, because you, you think yeah. about it in a way, like what happens when you bring a baby home from the hospital? It's all about all the new, the new carriage, the new stroller, the new crib. But at the other end of the spectrum, it's like, well, you, you might be using these objects actually for more time than the baby stroller. You might be using them for five, mm -hmm. the five to seven, five to 10 years, who knows? Why do they have to look that way? Why can't it be something that I'm gonna be proud to use if there's a word or bring joy or give me an experience versus this? So, you know, so that's something we're taking on as well is like, what is that store experience when you go to shop for these things? It's, it's pretty sad right now. And there's, and there's sort of no one known, no one brand known for that. So we thought that's ripe for uh, evolution. I don't always like to say disruption. I like to say evolution because you know, it's, it's important that you're working in a way as you develop these ideas and these experiences that people can still relate to them, that they're not mm -hmm. so disruptive in their lives. I mean, that's a strong word, disruptive. Evolution means you can ease into it. You know, there's a familiarity to the manner in which you become accustomed to something. You know, so we think, it, it, and, and we talk about in terms of like, all you need are one to three improvements in a product or an experience to be considered breakthrough. You know, if, in, and, and I mean something like, I'm, I'm an over the bed table uh, in a hospital. We noticed that they were always leaking liquid. If you spilt something on it, why can't you put a lip around an over, over the bed table to stop liquid from falling over. Or the way you had to adjust an overbed table is you had to push it down in order to push it up. And that just felt counterintuitive to us. Why can't it just, as you push it up, it goes up, not push down to go up. So I know, I know I'm talking a lot about this, but it's just, it, it basically because there's so many things that need help. There's so many yeah. things that yeah. need a new experience. And it doesn't have to be so, it, it's not invention. It doesn't have to be innovation. We just talk about it in terms of how can I improve the, improve the experience? It's about improvements, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just innovation is such a big word. And I've seen so many, mm -hmm. so many big companies with innovation departments. And at the end of the day, nothing comes out of them. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the best definitions I've heard for innovation is taking an existing situation and turning it into a preferred one. Mm. And once you, and you always want to revisit it 
because what's preferred now is going to change. But I just thought that's such a great way to, yeah. to phrase it. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit. Um, you're doing a lot of work. It seems like you work across lots of different industries, lots of different user groups. What are some um, industries or um, t- fields that really inspire you and you're kind of like curious about like, what's going on over there? Like, is it e-gaming or sports or, you know, something that is not necessarily within design, um, but still really piques your interest? Well, I mean, can you can you say art? Can you talk about art, or can you? Yeah. I, I yeah, mean, absolutely. Again, I always look. You know, the, I mean, design. Design is you know it's really for you're 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 looking to improve, as you said, a situation for people, and a lot of times, you know, with art, it's so objective, it's so personal, that I like the raw idea from that and how that can be evolved into something that might expand the way people feel, you know, the overall feeling of, of something. So I, I mean, I'm always looking at art and just the general idea of, especially sculpture. I love going to, to sculpture grounds where you can just sort of walk the land and see how that sculpture resonates with the landscape. And it's the combination of the natural environment with a, a sensitivity to a, to a built or to an objective uh, or a personal process that sort of intrigue me and how those come together. So, you know, I, so I still keep it at that, that sort of cultural art level, you know, because it, it, I think that's, that's happening a lot to understand the context of something in design or in the world in order to make sense of it. So I, I'm, I feel very strongly about the, the fact that I'm always finding myself wanting to look at art and then see how art can inspire me to move into other channels with design. Um, I, I, I would say, I, I think I'm going to leave it. I, I think I'm satisfied with that answer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that let me great. ask you this, because one of the things that you've said multiple times throughout our conversation is the word curious and curiosity. And I'm just, do you feel like that's an essential um, or innate desire that a, that, a, that a designer needs to have to, to design well? Oh, it's, I think it's paramount. I, I, mean, I think you have to put your filter on at all times and just, in, and just be, I would say, really conscious of what you're looking at and why you're looking at it and, and why it's holding your attention. You know, and it, 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 whether, it's, whether, whether you're reading something um, or viewing something. So I think maintaining that curiosity through your life. You, know, I, mm-hmm. you, have, you have it when you're a child. You know, it's, it's, it's an interaction of how you play. And I think design is, it's really important to still play at all ages when you're involved in design. I think if it gets too, if, if there's a rigor to it, that it's, it sort of loses its passion and it loses its buzz or its, its jazziness, especially for me, um, that, that, that would just be the end of the world for me. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, I just can't, and, and even, I always talk about like, even when I retire, I can't wait to retire so I can design. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it, it, cause it's because it's just that way it's just I'm, I, I'm always drawing I'm always thinking about something my filter's always on it's always good to have a new project to be able to run it through that through that filter and you know so it's so it, so that's and if not we, a lot of times we'll just develop our own project products like mm-hmm. like what I was saying before with a lot of those durable medical equipments where you know we started off by seeing that people weren't balancing correctly and that, that there was a real weakness in the idea of doing the cane you know that that walking yeah. stick that cane so we took it upon ourselves and our curiosity of that to like what can we do to bring to make that make that improvement so i think that's always going on mm-hmm. with us um whether it's you know whether and it, it and it's always through a, for us it's always through a, a manufacturing means because we're industrial designers product designers and at the end of the day it's not about doing some something custom you know, where it's a one-off, which is more what you're getting when you're, when you're doing more artful projects. It's about for, you know, running it through industry, you know, where it's, there's going to be big injection molding machines, you know, a lot of electricity, a lot of power, squeezing plastic through a tube to the end of the day, <laughs> make something, you know, something, something important. You know, we're making sure that everything we're doing is original, it's unique, 
it's important. Um, so it's not ever a me too product. It's always something that hasn't been, you haven't sort of laid your eyes on before, but you do recognize it for what it is. <laughs> so to that end, in, in thinking about making things for humans, how does sustainable product design play into that? So with the idea that, you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of different products will eventually end up in a landfill. Hopefully the ones that are well made and well designed don't because they're things that get passed down. But do designers have a, a responsibility for thinking through sustainable design? Absolutely. It's important to have that conversation up front with your client. Again, and the, and the partner, the people you're working with, um, it's, it's very important to understand their philosophy, their sort of corporate ethos on whether there's room for that. Because again, we're a design consultancy and we are putting ourselves out there to be partnering with someone who, a client, a partner who wants to do something seminal, something different. And sustainability can play a role in that. Now, at the end of the day, we don't always control that you know, it has to make sure it can fit in, whether if you're working on something that is very highly price sensitive, is there the ability to incorporate some sort of recyclable material into the mix or, you know, something that can easy, easily go back to the earth and dissolve back to the earth? Or the other idea is like how unique or how original or how special or beloved is a product that you want? Uh, and it, again, we're, we're, we're not designing for planned uh, idea of planned obsolescence. And in, in, in doing so, we want these products to be loved. We want people to connect mm -hmm. with them. Um, we want to make sure that there's a desire, there's a cachet. And I think that helps with the idea of sustainability, that they're well made and they're well desired, that they want to be used every day and they're going to last. And I think one of the, like an example that, you know, when you think about in Europe, Many times back back in the day, in the early days with in Europe, you, you'd own that one really great Armani suit, and you'd yep. have that Armani suit. I'm, I know I'm 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 aging. I'm, I'm just sort of aging myself, but you would have that one incredible suit that you would wear all the time, and it just lasted. It just lasted. Just, there was a quality to it, and we're seeing like a, a story that recently came up about products that are beloved. Is we came across, we got contacted by by this autism group. And they told us about this little boy um, who was nonverbal, and the only thing he w reacted to was a potato masher that we designed 15 years ago. <laughs> and this potato masher was used to help him speak. It had a black handle at the time, or a, bla a black, sh a black um, uh, shaft to it, and he learned the word black from this potato masher, and then he learned the word blue from the handle. And his parents, at that point, they couldn't peel the potato masher away from him. It became something of like a teddy bear or a plush. He loved, he would sleep wow. with this potato masher. And I mean that in the most beloved way that he connected, whatever the reason why with this, our potato masher, he connected to it and he won't let go. And he lost, and somehow it got misplaced. And we were contacted because he was really upset that his potato masher got lost. And now again, this is a 15 year old potato masher and we put our network into place and we you know, did our sort of next door neighbor idea and put our word out there. Does anyone have this potato masher? And within 15 minutes, someone in Pennsylvania had it. You know, I'm in Princeton, <laughs> someone in Pennsylvania had this potato masher and we, you know, we met it, you know, my partner met him at like a, at a Starbucks, you know, and they did the exchange of the potato masher. And then we mailed that down to Florida in order to get it to this, this young lad's hand so he could be at peace, you know, so he could be, uh, have some, you know, be comfortable in his life, you know, so, and then we were even seeing it in, you know, our wheelchair that we did for our, our transport chair for, for Stryker. Um, people, you can't buy it. A person, a, a regular person, you know, a, a regular consumer can't buy that wheelchair. You can only get it at, through the hospital. But someone called us and they said, we love this wheelchair. My father loves it. You know, do you know where we can get it? And we just said, you know, um, we just, I think if you check eBay, you might be able to get it because Stryker wouldn't sell it to them because they can't through different regulatory conditions. Right. So they, this, these, these, they, they, there are these people out there that just they covet these I, these designs mm -hmm. from from how many years ago, and they 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 want they're going to get them at any cost. And I'll leave you with this last story where even with that that tea kettle over my shoulder, we had a French poet 
who wrote to us, uh, and he just said to us, like, I tend to be really grumpy when I wake up in the morning. But now when I wake up, I take your tea kettle, I put it on the stove, the water boils, and the bird begins to sing. Damn you! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he loses all his grumpiness. <laughs> that is incredible. Donald, thank you so much for joining us. Tanya, thank you so much for co-hosting yeah, with me. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing all of the... I want to hear about this new tea kettle once it comes out on the market. Because <laughs> I too. understand the, the temperature control. But uh, thank you so much. And thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Square. Make sure you tune in next week. <laughs>